Welcome to Attack of Opportunity. Hello and welcome to Attack of Opportunity, which I'm calling right now the International Edition. Maybe it has something to do with a cool Men in Black movie going on. Maybe not. Maybe I'm just pulling in markers of some of the wonderful content creators out there that have helped us. And I think you should learn more about them. And tonight we have the one and only Sarah Linen, the voice actress yes we do work with professionals as amateurs we are they sometimes give us the time of the day and we are so lucky that you get to meet the person who has voiced princess eutropia stavian herself in our dice before dishonor war for the crown pathfinder rpg podcast and you've been sending us the demos and the tapes and all the lines that i've asked you for and i've mixed it in and it is great i've got such positive feedback not to mention the accent really, really works. And then it started a debate. But before we get to that, welcome. Thank you so much, Sarah, for being on the show today. No, oh, thank you for having me. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Um, I found Sarah on Twitter, where I'm usually pestering people. And you were nice enough to talk to me about your projects, your podcast that you're in, your mm -hmm. uh, your comedy troupe that you got going. We got back and forth one day, and I hit you up for some voice lines, and I expected to see a pound sign that it is my bill <laughs> if you want my talent. And you were so excited just to do something outside of your own projects and take the time to help us. So thank you. Thank you from my entire cast and crew, and especially myself. But to begin... The question that we ask all of our victims that we managed to drag here into the studio. <laughs> Sarah comes to us um, recorded live from the UK, but mm -hmm. I understand you are a New Zealander. That yeah, that's my, right. I'm from New Zealand. Migrated there. So you're currently in UK at the moment, hands across the water. But this has got to be a universal question. Question number one is, how did you first know yourself that you were a geek, a nerd, one of us, part of this, you know, geeky community that wanted to do this stuff? Was there a defining moment for you? Um, I'm not sure if there's a defining moment, but I have some like really solid memories of growing up um, and just being always surrounded by uh, gaming. I mean, I think the first thing I ever remember playing is Alex the Kid uh on um sega um but also sonic the hedgehog um that was kind of like i was just surrounded by games like from the moment i was a kid right up until now old school gaming old school gaming yeah. yes yes mm -hmm. that that actually covers my next question was you know was there a gateway drug that got you in it so you're saying video games um movies yeah. you know the rpg so you're playing your video games uh you're going to town when did you discover the tabletop aspect? Those lovely D20s that are not the D6 <laughs> crap dice. You know, when did, when did those come into your life? How long have you been that kind of gamer? Uh, I actually haven't been playing tabletop RPGs for that long. I'd say probably at this stage, um, maybe three years, maybe a little bit longer. I mean, be, being an actor by trade, like it was kind of a natural progression from also playing a a boatload of board games so it was like yeah you know what the next step up is yeah it's tabletop rpgs i'm like right i'm up for this let's do it <laughs> so you're an actor and a voice actor mm -hmm. this i know and we'll get into the personal questions in a bit and you're playing your video games three years ago um you got introduced by family friends boyfriend walk into a gaming shop in the uk actually actually it was my boyfriend definitely because we met and he was like oh um I was like, oh, what, do you, what have you been doing for the last week? And he'd be like, I, I've literally just been watching Critical Role. And at this point, I think they were right near the end of their first camping that they were playing. And I was like, what is this? Tell me about it. And he said, oh, it's Dungeons and Dragons. And I was like, okay, yeah, I've heard of Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Stranger Things was on TV at the time. And I'm like, okay, cool. Dungeons and Dragons is actually maybe starting to be cool. Um, but I'm like, you know what? I'll, I'll give it a go. I'll give it a go. Uh, and so me and uh, my boyfriend Connor and friend Steve and Paul, we all got together and we started playing um, Storm King's Thunder. Uh, although actually no, before that, before that, Connor was actually DMing in his own world. So he created, he was our DM and he created his own homebrew world. And then we thought, okay, we maybe like a little bit more structure. And so that's when we brought in the Storm King's Thunder campaign. 
and yeah and that was where like my actual foray into tabletop started so you got right into fifth edition or was there a different edition or yep. a homebrew edition that he was using yeah fifth edition yeah ah, right so right right into the commercial popular there you go absolutely now we promote all kinds of tabletop yes we are obviously very very heavy into pathfinder which is known as D, &D 3.75 um, mm -hmm. and we play some saga which is a star wars system that has died out and was the um prototype for fourth edition infamous D, &D. and that's what yeah. we're into now but we're you know we're always going to branch out and being forgotten realms fans from the novels and the second edition you know, we always always have our eye on this and fifth edition has set back into the forgotten realms world a hundred mm -hmm. years later different politics and yet old characters i just saw jarlax jarlaxel the dro from the drit series mm -hmm. pop up on on a, an adventure called the vault and i was like oh man I miss Forgotten Realms so much, but you know, fifth <laughs> edition is, is like so much out there with you guys. Mm -hmm. So you're playing fifth edition and have you ever tried your hand like behind the screen or are you strictly a player at this point? Strictly a player, but not necessarily stopping myself from, I, I have an idea in my head for a, a one shot, um, yeah, fifth edition D and D, but I haven't actually properly formulated it. I have an idea. Uh, and obviously I don't, I don't want to give away too much because most of the people that are going to watch this will probably play in it and I want no spoilers. <laughs> okay, no spoilers. <laughs> Can you give us a hint? Is there like a movie or a genre or something that sparked that inspiration? It, where you sound Yeah, like, oh. I'm thinking it might, it might have something to do with Disney and it might have something specifically to do with Disney villains, but I'm not going to okay. say anything else. No, nope, thank you for not saying it has to do with Disney <laughs> princesses. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, villains, I, I just, evil campaign oh, one shot yeah. evil oh there great. you go there you go oh we're doing that too we um we're setting up a cast for pathfinders hell's vengeance where you get to play all evil characters under this lawful evil country and stop a bunch of paladins who have decided to crusade their way right in there and it's it's different it's very very challenging we're actually looking to cast a different gm than myself because i'm kind mm -hmm. of oversaturated in in the network gming too many things but anyway sorry I digress, as usual. Um, <laughs> now, I the next set of questions usually it just flows. You're doing this, you're playing games. Now you're playing tabletop, mm -hmm. and then the next question I always you hit people with is, when did you just decide to start making your own content and become a content creator? But I remember you're a voice actress, so mm -hmm. that came first. I'm wondering if someone came to you and said hey let's do this or can you help like you already have a web presence you're doing this for a living so let's put the the content on pause and jump forward a little bit and talk about you so is the voice what would you like to know <laughs> the voice acting is it strictly voice acting uh i know there's a theater project that we're going to talk about or whatever um and like what are you doing now what do you do for a living shall we say do you mind me asking? So I, I do loads of stuff, but I think like in terms of voiceover, it's been a thing that I've been doing for about five, six years or so. And it was sort of very slow going to start with because it's, I mean, it's not as saturated in terms of like uh, how many actors there are in the world, but it's starting to become quite popular, quite fun. People realize that there's, I mean, well, there's, there can be a lot of money in it depending on what sort of type of voiceover you're doing but also it's really fun it's amazing to be sitting in a room and kind of just creating something with just a way that you say a word or the way that you say a phrase and that i really enjoy it i really really love it and it's always been something i've wanted to do more actually probably from watching a lot of animated stuff when I was a kid. I was like, you know what? I love things like like Toy Story, um, I mean, all the old school Disney's. I grew up with all of that. So I was like, I would love to voice a character at some point. And then I was a big gamer too. And then when games started to develop in this way that it was a lot more storytelling and, and voice acting and mocap was a thing. I was like, ah, I want to do that. Cause it like combines <sighs> the whole, I love acting and I love being a nerd. Let's just put those two things together. So like my, my next big, push is to try and get to more video games and to voice a video game character oh yeah i love how they actually make the character resemble 
Disney or video games. I yeah. mean, so many people don't know that Ron Perlman, who played the original Hellboy, is in the Halo series of video games. He's like one of these generals, and they yeah. make it. They basically take the haircut and the forehead, and they go, "There you go." And he's smoothly talking here and there in this odd cutscene. I'm like, "Oh my god, that's that's Ron Perlman! I love it." <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. Uh, John Rice Davies is in the third Disney Aladdin cartoon as Aladdin's father, and he, there's no mistaking his voice. He was in Sliders. Yeah. He's in the original Indiana Jones movie. He's the sidekick. Indy, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, great, great work. And these icons probably back in the day weren't paid a lot. It wasn't until I was just watching a documentary. Uh, it wasn't until Robin Williams came along and did the genie in Aladdin where it suddenly became this big thing for a name mm. to sort of pad their career with this extra type of work. And some make a lot of money on it. And then some, suddenly just the doors mm. opened and they just start getting everybody they can and paying them substantial. Yep. And I'm wondering, is it um, where is it? the recognition of the big names and those people in those movies that got you hooked or was it just the idea of going to work and staring at a pop filter for eight hours a day <laughs> um. <laughs> i think i mean it's it's i mean it's amazing when when you recognize a voice in a film you're like oh i totally know who that is but i also i think you know we're we're, we're moving too far into that it'd be much nicer to have a voice that you don't know because then you don't have an association with it in terms of oh uh oh that's that's mandy moore um playing um, rapunzel entangled and you go okay well i know what mandy moore's singing career is like so we kind of know what to expect from her vocally yeah i guess you, it would be nice to just be able to go and watch something and kind of go into the world and not have a preconceived idea about that character or what that you know what that person's already voiced mm -hmm. or played as an actor so I, yeah it'd be nice plus you know no one really knows me so put me in something. <laughs> well, we're trying to change that. We're trying to change that. I mean, got you already one of my yes. podcasts, you know. Um, I would get you and half your crew working with me or under my brand. But like I said, you guys are your own brand. You're doing your own thing. Uh, but like mm -hmm. walk, walk on cameos and stuff. Something that's becoming popular that we're really trying to work on is not just recycle mm -hmm. cast from other shows into the other shows doing five minute bit play someone's father play someone's you know this type of thing. Um, mm -hmm. Is everybody love Star Wars? And I've used this as payment or you know to hook to hook people working with whatever it's like and would you, would you mind doing a voiceover in our star wars campaign it's gonna run for five years it's 10 bucks and they're like star wars yeah 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 you know they all get they get all ewan mcgregor when he was offered obi-wan he's like star wars yeah too right yeah yeah, yeah. yeah kind of thing. <laughs> um and then you then you gotta pin them down and mm -hmm. it's oh i can't do that night i get, you know they've suddenly realized mm. that you know as much as you're interested in, in doing this work on top of your own projects or whatever, they are already content created. They are already booked. They are already doing all this stuff. So again, mm -hmm. thank you so much for taking the time, not just for this interview, but for the work you've done with us. Oh, you're uh, welcome. But let, let's get it was back. Fun. Yeah, oh, I'm glad. I'm glad because I got more for you. There's more emails and more lines. You know. <laughs> She's a major NPC. The princess. The princess so, is know, coming back. Pops up, you know. Um, and that's, you know, that's the subtlety in me saying the Disney princess joke. I don't know if you got, you know, the depth of it. <laughs> I like um, it. I like it. My next question for you is, so you're five, six years of voice acting and you said you only been gaming mm -hmm. for three years. So how long were you gaming before yourself? Somebody mentioned it to you or was this your idea to start podcasting, like to start a content creation of your own with the RPGs? How did that get going? Uh, so I was actually at a voiceover networking event um, called uh, uh, Get Your Game On, which is a voiceover networking event in London every year. And it's about uh, meeting other people in the industry who are also interested in, in uh, putting their voice into video games. And I was wearing a D&D t-shirt that day. And Alex Maud was at this, uh, at this convention and just came up to me and said, oh, you play D&D? And I was like, yeah. And then we got talking. And he said that he had this idea that he wants to use his homebrew world that he's creating to, uh, yeah, to play a YouTube show, which will also be a podcast, uh, yeah, of his game. And he was like, "Would you play? I don't have enough women." And I was like, "That, yeah, absolutely, uh, yeah, let's talk more about this." And then we sort of got chatting, and I suggested because um, Connor's a, a big old nerd as well, Connor, my boyfriend, uh, and he came along and met Maud. We just call him Maud because we've got two Alexes, so he's Maud. Uh, and then we decided, yeah, let's do it. Let's give it a go. We sort of played a few one shots to get, because we didn't know the others and Maud knew them. So he brought us all together. We played a couple of one shots and realized that we had some really good chemistry. 
And we're like, okay, yeah, let's try filming it and see what happens. And it was, um, it was really, it was really tough to start with. Like, is there's kind of like a, a consciousness of, oh, oh, there's a camera on me right now. No. Okay, <laughs> not used to that. Not used to that. I, I want to yeah. something really quickly because you may not know. I've dug up a lovely photo. Um, someone's put together like a collage photo of your cast of Mod World, and I've got your your logo up there. So right beneath you, we have, I believe, the DM with a beard. Is that yep, Alex? Yeah, that's Alex Maud himself. Okay, then kind of going left to right, um, we have a gent that's somewhere between. Um, hmm. How can I describe this gentleman? Um, well, let me flip to the other panel. I can see you. You're in the middle of Ham's class, okay. having a great time, in the middle of a great laugh, and I can see Connor right next to you. He's got the very mm -hmm. long, long rocker That's hair it. and the chin strap. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And you're in the middle uh, wearing yep. a dark sweater. So there's the two of you. That's you and Connor. And then you got a guy in Adidas shirt, uh, and he looks like, oh, God, I'm so bad with names. Um, you just man mentioned Mandy Moore, and she did uh, a musical. And what's not L.A. story, it's... Um, Oh, I can't believe this guy's really, really popular right now. Uh, Ryan Gosling. You got a Ryan Gosling clone in yep. the corner here. Who's that? Is that short Ryan hair, Gosling blonde clone. hair, blonde hair, short? Uh, he's the one, stubble. like, as in, so you've got Connor and then you've got another girl and then he's on the end? No, you're in the middle between two guys. Connor's on your right and on your left yeah. is a guy in Adidas t shirt and he's blonde yeah. and he's got a bit of stubble, very short hair on the sides. Yes. Who's that? That is Andy Murray. Okay. I know he's got the same name as the tennis player, but like, <laughs> okay. I don't know who came first. I wonder who's older. Anyway, that's Andy Murray, and he plays our uh, he plays Drake, who is a I think he's a, a ranger. Anyway, he does a lot of like shooting, shooting stuff. So <laughs> that's he's true. an arcane His archer. I'm just being corrected from someone who knows okay. better than I that, do. That's good. I just that's know good. that he's called Drake. <laughs> there you go. He's, he's the guy that shoots the thing and does the thing. Um, <laughs> On, on, another, on another couch, you have um, another uh, gent and lady, and she mm -hmm. has hair part in the middle, like straight mm -hmm. down, very long, right to her tummy uh, hair. Who's that? That is Sarah Scott. So we have two Alexes and two Sarahs, just to keep it nice and confusing for everyone. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, so she plays our cleric. Okay. Uh, Esther um yes she is actually out of all of us she's the only one who isn't uh an actor um but her uh her character is is really interesting she's like a 16 year old uh human girl uh cleric grave cleric so she's like a little bit creepy and weird and wistful um so it's a really interesting dynamic because everyone else except maybe connor's character we're all quite like out there and dynamic and she's really solemn and really like <laughs> Oh, that's good. Yeah, though. a little bit creepy. Sorry, like for the interview, like the camera's here, um, but like I said, all the the software's over here, so I'm I'm talking like on this weird angle. Uh, and last we have, um, <coughs> I, I'd have to say Sam from Game of Thrones. All you got to do is darken his hair and his beard because he's got this lit up laugh and eyes of like, and he looks like, <laughs> you know, Sam just discovered his favorite yep. book here. And who's that? Yep, that is Alex Wells King. Um, so he's our other Alex. Uh, he plays, uh, he is a monk in the campaign, um, but he's like a tiny, tiny little um, little elderly guy. So he's a little bit like deceptive in terms of his kind of everyday demeanor. It's quite outrageous. He's like, I'm an old man and I can't really hear you. And then he will just come out with like, you know, full on monks, like punches and kicks and everything and destroy things. It's oh yeah, amazing. no, that, that's an awesome trope. That's a real thing in anime and stuff. He's in, like, a, yeah. like a yoga, uh, yoga, Yoda kind of character. <laughs> okay yoga he probably is quite bendy but no yeah. no that's good that's what I meant. um but no that's that's more of a thing you'd surprise american audience is, is really digging anime these days and the, you know mm -hmm. the, the little guy that suddenly you know pulls the shirt and has is all ripped or just pulls a move that you wouldn't expect yeah um yeah. so where can we find this show this is an actual play podcast fifth edition mm -hmm. And you mentioned running Storm King. What are you running at the moment? Is there like canon stuff that you're doing your version of? Or it says Mod World. Are we back into the homebrew mm -hmm. right now? Yeah. So the whole campaign is uh, is Alex Maud's homebrew world of Libraria. And so he's he's created everything. There's a pantheon of gods. There's uh, an entire continent. Um, so at the moment we are... Oh, actually, I'm trying to think. I've been not 
give any spoilers away because we're probably two episodes ahead in terms of what we've filmed because we film ahead and then we release originally it was oh, uh, no. weekly and now we're fortnightly no, think, so we're think... probably a couple episodes ahead at the moment but we're um, sort of in the dwarven territory at the moment oh i meant like think page one you know like he's he's uh, alex mod does his own world it's called librarian mm -hmm. you know um mm -hmm. you have cast of characters you're pulling classes and races out of the book maybe he's added mm -hmm. some races and you're going from there so it's a homebrew is also a very significant people are like yep everyone's done curse of strahd everyone's mm -hmm. done you know and they'll start turning to the homebrew whether it's rules mm -hmm. or you know all these sub genres um so you've got your feet wet in mod world and you're currently mm -hmm. podcasting or vodcasting or streaming. So show. it's all recorded um, and then edited and then uploaded to YouTube. So the, the primary idea is that we are a, a visual uh, game, actual game play. Um, and it is YouTube primarily, but we also have um, uh, the podcast version, which is simply the audio extracted from the video. Yeah. Uh, and that is available basically anywhere that you can um, listen to podcasts. So yeah, um, I think we have uh, it's Anchor. I think is the person who looks after our um, our actual podcast, and then you know you can find it on Spotify, on iTunes, basically anywhere that you oh, use podcasts. Oh, that, that's good. Like the, if you're on Spotify or iTunes, you're you know you're out there. You're get pulling one of the big ones. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So um, getting back to you. Now, in the acting, you talked about a new project, a recent project, and this is the other artwork that I've that you've uploaded to me, and it's a lovely black and white. This looks like the medieval art where you'd open those book, and you have this black and white sketch of um, the doctor, you know, opening up a patient or you know giving the herb. It looks like mm. somewhere like an ancient Leo DiCaprio or Leo DiCaprio, Leonardo da Vinci slash, um, you know, the black and white sketchbook thing. Um, and I'm looking at pillars framing mm -hmm. a flower field with a whole bunch of flowers and weeds popping up and a quartet of skeletons, each holding instruments. And mm -hmm. I've got, what have we got? We've got the, the drum that hangs on the hip. Pum -pum -pum. Mm -hmm. We got a harp on a sling and it's almost a full harp. So it's not the one that you need to sit at, but this, this goes from his chin to his knees and then you're kind of losing me from there. Uh, is that a bassoon, a bagpipe? What do we got going? An accordion? That is that is an excellent question. I, it is. Uh, what would you say that is? It's like a. Let's bring this up here. It looks like a like a medieval version of bagpipes, maybe. But it also it also has like um, keys on it, so it looks like a, an accordion, maybe. Um, I don't know. It's, it looks quite old school, whatever it is. But then the next one is is definitely oh, definitely bad bagpipe. bagpipe the one no, on the far you, end you, you, is you notice how bagpipes. his left hand is cranking a winch that's yeah that's like a, he's got it's like a portable organ i'm thinking yeah yeah Cause, yeah because yeah. he's cranking the the pressure so, or the you know to, to make it go he is he is yeah i've also got, made like, it yeah some sort of accordion I, thing i've made the image a bit bigger now for the for the youtube audience and are they all wearing ties what is this in the middle looks like they're all wearing a tie or Ooh, a, i was just i had it brought up and then it just disappeared are they all wearing oh, Something. No, they're not really, but they are very sort of skeletal. Okay. Um, I mean, just to cover their bits and pieces, but they are skeletons, and they're like, I guess they're actually it's kind of a little flesh. I mean, looking like we got arms. It and looks. Chests. It looks almost like it's a. Um, it does look like they are wearing something, though. I'd say it maybe like a. Um, um, I don't know, like a giant loincloth. <laughs> <laughs> so now that we've uh, over described the imagery, um, tell us about <laughs> this what this is what this uh you know in place logo is for in your career here yeah so um myself and four friends uh sorry three friends of mine so there's four of us all together so it's myself connor uh paul and steve actually the original group that played storm king's thunder uh we're all also uh actors and performers um paul and steve had an existing theater company and they decided that there was only so far that they could get with just the two of them and so they asked Connor and I, if we'd be interested in forming a brand new theater company together with them. And that is what this is. This is essentially, this is the four of us getting together. Um, it's going to be different than their existing theater company um, in that at the moment they produce uh, just pieces of theater. Uh, but what we're doing as Uncanny Collective is we're going to be, it's going to be multimedia. It's going to be podcasts. It's going to be hopefully some short film, um, definitely still theater uh kind of a combination of anything and everything and, and utilizing the fact that i think like 
podcasts and media are such a, a big thing at the moment. So mm -hmm. we are going to have two facets to it. One of it is going to be um, sort of an anthology of horror stories. So you'll have like little sort of like 20 to 30 minute um, short stories that are, they're all horror based. So that's kind of our shtick. Uh, horror, creepy, eerie, unnerving stuff. Uh, and then the other element of the podcast will be a more um, story driven. It'll be maybe 20, 25 minute episodes uh, and it'll be telling uh, a story that will continue on through maybe a series of episodes. We haven't sort of fully written it yet, but it's it's starting out and it's going to be really fucking creepy. I'm really excited. <laughs> no, that sounds great. That sounds great. Um, the the Curse of Strahd for fifth edition, mm -hmm. the... Mm -hmm. um, Strange Aeons for Pathfinder Adventure Path, as well as Carrion Crown. And you got Strahd and Carrion Crown are that Vincent Price gothic horror vampires werewolves. Nice. And you've got Strange Aeons is real tentacle, other world dimension tentacle stuff coming at you. You know, beware mm -hmm. of the octopus. Like Eldritch -y and yeah. Eldritch, yeah, that's 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 mm -hmm. the one. Um so would you say that you guys or then there's your like your pop-up horror or you know the, the chills from the dark side like that mystery of like what happened or the killers in the wood you know is there any kind of genre that you guys lean to in this creep in this uh, you know in your darker performances yeah i think we are maybe slightly leaning more towards more contemporary stuff because obviously you know gothic stuff is really fun but i think we want to kind of play with the idea of the uncanny, um, the reason why we chose the name is because we want to kind of have things that are not what they seem. Uh, and yeah, definitely more contemporary, um, weird, uh, and kind of stuff that makes you sort of like, maybe a little bit uncomfortable, but not in not in a way that you're, yeah, oh, I so can't stand watching this, but in a way that you can't, you can't look away. Yeah, yeah like you're, that you're, makes sense. You, it sounds like you're going to try and unite Alfred Hitchcock and Black Mirror. Yeah, absolutely. Black, I love Black Mirror. And also we've, we've been, um, just in terms of developing content for us, we've been playing a couple of things offline. Um, we looked up um, some horror RPGs. So we play like 10 Candles. Uh, we played something called View Scream um, last night. Um, have you heard of it before? Uh, no, I, I've heard of it, but I'm, I'm not familiar with like how, how the game runs. It's, it's really, I mean, there's not much in terms of mechanics uh, to the game. It's more about... Uh, it's heavy on the improv, so you kind of have to be fully role playing in order for it to really work. And the idea is that everyone who's playing, so you have four players, everyone plays in a different room of the house, and you all Skype in uh, into a Skype call with the four of you. And there are essentially uh, there's one person who sort of GMs, sort of doesn't, and they're the bridge on a spaceship, uh, and everyone else is trapped in various rooms in the spaceship, and something is coming to get you, and you sort of have a few things that you need to achieve in order to escape where you are and you have ways of solving other pre people's problems and so you kind of have to work together in order to escape but a few of your solutions are not actually going to help people and you don't necessarily know that so the, the, the player knows that but the actual character in the game doesn't know whether the thing they're going to suggest is going to help that person or not um, and there's also some really nice little character bits that are peppered in to just be like it, okay so you have this relationship with this one and you know you your your ulterior motive is this and it's yeah it's really fun it's really creepy i ended up playing um some messed up surgeon who um i don't know how it developed but it came out that i i had been seen by someone else basically with my hands inside another human being just being like i just want to feel what it feels like to put my hands inside someone and then see the blood flowing yeah it was really creepy it was gross <laughs> and wonderful so I enjoyed I'm just, it. I was going to say, um, these suggestions, is it a way of like screwing over another player? Like, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm going to help you open door number four and like it will eat them instead of eating you. And it's like, you know, I don't have to run fast. I just have to run faster than you. So the creature gets you. Is there that kind of dynamic where let's work together? Kind of but thing. yeah, yeah. we recently got a tabletop game called, uh, I think it's Mansion on the Hill. And it's a real scooby game. Yeah, the real Scooby Doo. Four people. You pick your guys. You're you're in the lobby, and the the map are tiles. So as you randomly place the tiles on the levels, the house builds itself as you go. And as you're going, there's these omens that pop up. So they have this book, and it's like a choose your own adventure book. So every time you play, um, it, the game goes and goes and goes and goes, and it just gets to a point where it's on, and the the big mm -hmm. story, the big creep is revealed. And we had, we had my son trapped in a room playing chess with death. 
while we were running around trying to break holy seals, we had six doppelgangers of ourselves pop up in another game. We had one where and there's always a traitor. Suddenly a player runs off, reads a book, and becomes a traitor. I love this game. You just, you just endlessly play it. It's completely different to your run of scenarios. Um, that sounds so good. I, yeah. I've only, I think I've only played it once, um, and it was amazing. Like I, I'm a big fan of it. It's a really, really good game. And you can pick a different guy, and you know, but that um, that's about as creepy as I go. Like honestly, the Eldritch stuff. Um, we played. My wife and I played a game for GameCube called Eternal Darkness, and it was the first Eldritch thing you saw. And this game was mean. There was never a video game that would pretend to not save, that would reverse all the controls, that would uh. say give you a fake loading screen saying the save and data is corrupt for 30 minutes long really trying to bait you to shut off and ruin your game like this game was mean and awesome <laughs> <laughs> at the same time um but um so you have a lovely bunch of hobbies you have a new yeah. crew on stage or online or like where does the uncanny collective produce their content are you running around theater to theater or is this a, a live stream where's where are you going with this new stuff so the theatre stuff will uh, be either in actual theatres in London um, or the other thing that we quite like to do is explore places that aren't necessarily traditional places to put on uh, theatre. So uh, I, we're in conversation with a friend of mine who is um, they're, they're sort of, I, I guess, kind of cleaning up or... Uh, uh, it's a, it's an old chapter house, so it's it's a little bit creepy because you've just got the foundations, uh, and we're looking at hopefully performing in there. That'd be great. Um, we with the <laughs> theatre company they already have. We we have that in Canada. Um, it's called uh, vagrancy and loitering. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but if they say we can do it, it's not the same, right? Well, do you, would, you, would, would you would you pamphlet and bring an audience to this unstructural you know uh, fire hazard or whatever, or are you just going to do like the improv where <laughs> unless you're in a park, people don't really know. We call it guerrilla theater. They don't know they're an audience. They'd be walking by you know the last house on the hill, and mm -hmm. you guys are in there in the middle of your show, hoping somebody notices, and you're probably just going to get a cruiser pull up and like. Burp, burp, what are you doing in the house? Um, <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess most of it hasn't actually, it's all kind of preformed and there will be like flyers and, and events put on Facebook and that sort of thing and shared with people. So w it is all pre-organized stuff. I mean, I don't think, I mean, it'd be quite fun to do something more guerrilla. That'd be interesting. But like you say, we don't want to get pulled over by the police. Do, do, do they have guerrilla theater in UK? Because like back in the day, we would go to the Eaton Center and put one of us in full hiking gear. I mean, like the real yodeler looking, like the straps and the backpacking and the, the tall socks <laughs> and the, the walking ski poles, you know, and get mm -hmm. him halfway down an escalator. And then he would just turn around and hike his way and stay in the middle and break traffic coming <laughs> down. Like he was hiking, like just, you know, and you just wait for security. And this is before cell phones. This is like early 90s before you could just like record it. You just did it. A bunch yeah. of us are hiding under the stairwell waiting for security, you know, and the, the security guard comes up, you know, <laughs> up the other side and gets to him is like sir what are you doing he's like i'm on vacation you know i like, <laughs> couldn't afford to go anywhere so i went downtown toronto eaton center and you know hiking stuff like that um there was there was a bit we did where um we have the subculture of french Can french canadians so we're a bilingual country mm -hmm. and a lot of it's contained contained in our state our province of quebec and a couple mm -hmm. times they've like oh we're gonna be in our own country we're, we're gonna leave you know and we're like, yeah, that's nice. Um, well, we have all the hydro and most of the water. Well, that's still nice. And we have one of the biggest military bases. Still great. But, you know, and it just we just kind of let them stop talking eventually. And, you know, but it was a big <laughs> thing. And we were making fun of how we caught an American news feed, how they got the wrong province. Or they were uh, not really sure of the angle. And we're listening to going, well, that's not quite right. Anyway, they corrected it. You know, it, was, it wasn't fake news or anything. Yeah. So we got a mixing board and a table and got downtown Toronto and we got one of those VCR cameras that you could just rent, but it looks like a great mm -hmm. big thing with a tape deck, right? You put a guy in a yeah. white t-shirt with the um, um, red hanky hanging out of the, the jean pocket, looking like a certain album cover. And <laughs> um, a buddy of mine spent some of his, um, some of his OSAP money for college on a silk suit. 
and he looked halfway between Anchorman and Mafia, and he's on the street <laughs> with, with a fake microphone, and he's running up to Canadians going, hey, you know, we're Keith Ediel from American News, you know, on the scene here in Canada. How do you feel about um, British Columbia separating? You know, how do you feel about Nova Scotia <laughs> separating like every other province that, you know, and it was all over the news and, the, you know, the people coming up going, you know, we had this one old guy. He just kind of reached up quietly and pulled the microphone down and leaned into our guy. And he was like, it's actually Quebec. You might want to, you know, check that before you interview <laughs> view people live and then just let the mic come back up and walk away. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like there's got to be a, like if you got a hat down or something people know it's up they know they're on candid camera like the idea yeah, of guerrilla yeah. theater is breaking that window of fear like staying mm. in character and no matter what happens as opposed to being arrested you stay in character you, you let it go you know the audience will just do what they do yeah now with social media everybody's like oh somebody's doing something and out comes all the phones because the whole world mm -hmm, knows mm -hmm. that you can get that attention on the street yeah. um so this long-winded story it's supposed to be a question for you. Um, when you guys pick a venue like this for impact, mm -hmm. you know, is the building condemned? No, not quite. It's just hasn't been used. Great. You know, it's not one of those American abandoned malls where the guys run through going, we're not supposed to be here. You set yourselves up. You, you ticket the flyers. People show up. Um, your shows, how long do they run? Like, do you try and hold an audience here for like an hour? Or is this like an afternoon? Or like, how long can you keep this up before you feel that like somebody's going to show up and say you don't have a permit? Or for the audience are looking around for the hat to put money in? Or you're just happy that any family, any stroller, any kid, any enthusiasts or fellow students, you know, just come and enjoy your free content? I'm assuming it's free. Uh, well, it's not it's it, yeah we we normally do actually have permission to perform where we perform we haven't actually gone full gorilla or even a little bit gorilla we tend to we, we it's all pre-organized um one of the places that we're about to be performing in is uh, an old cemetery which is also a park um but it's all pre-arranged there's actually a lot of bureaucracy to actually be performing in these spaces anyway so it's it's almost safer to do that because yeah we wouldn't want to be in a position where like you say like someone stops us in the middle of something because then you've invested a lot of time and uh and and money to actually put something on um and so yeah you don't want to lose out on being able to actually show people what you've put together so you're spending money on this you're spending the time on it uh and is mm -hmm. this just for exposure to get discovered by like a company and be you know the next big thing or whatever or is this is this just a part of your uh, your actor and career that you want to explore. Uh, I guess, I guess what I'm trying to ask you next question is like, what's the end game for these guys just to do it because you're young and loitering charges don't stick. Um, you know, this <laughs> kind of thing, or, you know, like, uh, is there a perceivable where you're going to take this or what you're trying to achieve at this point? Uh, I mean, because, um, the event is, is ticketed. And um, so, you know, there's a, there's, I guess as long as it goes well, there is a financial element to it. So yay, mm. we get paid to perform. But I think there's also in amongst, at least me, I don't want to speak for all three of the others, but like for uh, for me, it's actually being able to uh, perform, like the actual performing and interacting with someone and sharing uh, a moment with the audience is, that's what I'm doing it for. Like I do it because like that is, that is important to me. Telling a story, having a moment of shared, joy or terror or anything like elicit some sort of emotion that maybe someone didn't know they were going to have when they came to see something i really like that i like the element of surprise of it all and yeah being able to present something to someone and just let them have a really good time i, I think that's that's a huge element too just i guess take people away from some of the stress and like craziness that's going on in the world and to just come into a world where they just get to watch and enjoy and yeah yeah that's that's brilliant. I'm I'm humbled by your answer. I'd like to withdraw some of my jokes that if I you thought I was poking fun <laughs> at what you do, I poke fun at everything. But I actually have a huge amount of respect. Um, studying drama through high school and a little bit beyond, but not you know never at your level, not seriously at your level. Uh, D and D and that kind of thing becoming a creative outlet for someone like myself. Uh, but you're really walking the line. Like you not only you're gaming for fun and making content where a lot of people go, that's it. You're still in the theater's mind's eye. You're still doing, you know, you're still walking the walk. And mm -hmm. I got to say, like, if you you people listening or whatever, uh, that's impressive because 
getting a single podcast, getting a half a dozen people to commit is hard and getting it up mm -hmm. every week. Doesn't matter if your audio quality is great or not, just getting it going and keeping it going is difficult and you got to love it. But juggling what you're doing on top, like both would be completely time consuming. Plus the relationship. Yeah, they you really know. are. Yeah. So like, honestly, respect for Sarah Lyman, ladies and gentlemen. And we've been talking over budget, over time. So we'd just like to thank you so much for being on the show, for telling us every little thing that you're into lately. And mm -hmm. we can find you on Twitter at Sarah Lyman, S-A-R-A -A Lyman. Mm -hmm. How do you spell your last name? I keep forgetting. L-Y-N-A-M. Right. And the lovely laughing picture of the brunette I see in front of me, head tilted ever so slightly. That's the girl you want to follow. And Mod That's World, it. the Mod World logo. It's a lovely double pyramid reflected in water. The, the word, word in the middle with a sort of a, a cream boche with a tea stain on it, so to speak. It's the best way I can describe mm -hmm. this logo. Find these people, follow these people. And, uh, you know, send your love, your your um, <clears throat> your acting props that are left over from your career their way. They need all the help they can get. Just mail it over to UK, you know, the, the... <laughs> or building permits. You know, I bet if anyone's got a building permit lying around or any kind of like land, you know, that these guys could perform, it'd be a big help. Yes, we're here for that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next time on Attack of Opportunity. Bye.